Hey, what's up everybody? Hope you guys are having a wonderful evening. Hope your day went well. I'm just hoping good things upon everybody. <laughs> With that being said, you guys know I never try to do things to clickbait people. Uh, any one of my subscribers know that, that I don't put up clickbait type of BS. Uh, but the way I got to label this one, it might sound like clickbait, but trust me, it's not. I would stick all the way to the end because this one story right here, out of any story I could ever post, this one right here, you actually need to stick to the end to find out what the heck is going on. And as you go through it and as you watch it yeah you're gonna really not even comprehend like <laughs> it's it's just a, a crazy crazy ass story so um yeah i've heard it before and i know it's not a new reaction for me uh but when i'm thinking about videos that i wanted to uh like i said i didn't want to make a complete fan page you know kind of channel uh, even though I'm a huge fan, but I wanted to diversify and make it, you know, uh, about a whole bunch of things that I like. And I had, I had binge watched Mr. Ball, Ballin for all the lockdown. I, I binge watched, uh, there's this guy named Sci-Fi Dan, or, yeah, Sci-Fi Dan. Um, I think he, he, he might be a physics professor or physics teacher something along those lines but uh he goes around just basically bitch slapping freaking um all these people who believe in flat earth <laughs> if you're one of those people i'm sorry i'm sorry if i offended you i'm not trying to offend you if you believe the earth is flat that's that's your agenda but uh yeah he goes around and I mean, nine times out of ten, it does no good anyway, so. Uh, but anyways, without further ado, the crazy, one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. At the end of today's story, a lot of you are going to be shaking your head, wondering how in the world could they have missed that? But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to make the like button a sandwich of their choosing, but when you build it, make it between two very thin, stale rye bread heels. Also, please... <laughs> two very thin, stale rye bread heels. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 2006, Heather Kwan was a 21-year-old college student living in the small residential town of Desert Hills in Arizona. From a very young age, Heather was someone who always seemed to give her friendship to the people who needed it the most. People who were hurting on the inside or who society had kind of forgotten about. This is why when she was a teenager and a young adult, she would often spend her weekends volunteering her time with underprivileged children. It's also why she aspired to go to law school and become a defense lawyer because she loved the idea of professionally helping people that desperately needed her help. She lived in a rental home with her boyfriend who was 18 years old. His name was Ryan Waller. And amongst other things, he was a huge gun enthusiast and a student. That year, the couple had made plans to visit Ryan's father, Don, on Christmas Day, so on December 25th. But when the day came and Don had made dinner for the couple and was expecting them, they didn't show up. And so Don tried contacting both of them, but when he couldn't, he just had a bad feeling that something was off. It was just very uncharacteristic of them to just no-show. But instead of driving over to their property himself, Don just called the local police and asked them to do a welfare check. The police arrived at the house in Desert Hills, Arizona. They knocked on the door, but there was no answer. They looked in the windows and some lights were on, but it was mostly dark inside. And they couldn't really tell from the car in the driveway if that belonged to the homeowners or somebody else. And so they stood 
there for a second, they're looking in the windows, there's no movement. They knock again while simultaneously calling out that, hey, we're the police, we're here to do a welfare check, just wanna make sure you guys are okay. And this time, after they were done knocking, they heard the deadbolt unlock and then the door swung inward into the house and standing right in front of them was Ryan. Ryan had this huge bruise on his left eye, this big black eye, and he had a cut on his nose and he was just standing there, not saying anything, not asking any questions, just looking at them. And they looked past Ryan into his house and they saw there was a woman lying on the couch, which they presumed was his girlfriend. You know, and that's where I kind of give cops a lot of fl uh, slack because you never, ever know what you're walking into. Um, until I start seeing a rise in popularity for uh, true crime stories, there is this one YouTube video that just, it, it really did make me, make me see both sides of it. I mean, yes, you still have your cops who, I, I call them, you know, they, they grew up during the Call of Duty uh, era, so I call them Call of Duty cops, you know, shoot, shoot first and shoot as many bullets as you can. Uh, and I know that's, you know, poor taste uh, to have been, you know, acting like that when I was younger. But, you know, nowadays, some some of their actions are warranted. A lot of them aren't. And both sides both have convincing arguments. But, you know, as a cop, seeing seeing that, you know, as soon as they answer the door, I mean, it just, what do you do? Like... You know, if you have your hand on your gun, then automatically, you know, you're labeled as a, you know, ready to shoot at all costs. But that's not the case. It's just like, you know, you don't know what you're walking into. So, you know, for uh, for the police that do, you know, honorably protect us, you know, I, I wish the best for you guys. Thank you. Um, for you cops that don't, I hope... Uh, I hope you'll come around to uh, to the good side. Get away from that dark side, man. It's not worth it. And Heather, because that was the two people they were coming to look for. And so they turned their attention back to Ryan and they asked him, you know, what happened to your eye? And Ryan was a little bit cagey. He didn't really give them a straight answer. He basically said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to my eye. And, you know, the police didn't really pry that much, but eventually they determined that Ryan was more or less okay, albeit a little bit strange. And then they said, okay, well, who's the woman who's lying on the couch? Is that Heather? And Ryan, again, was kind of cagey and a little bit dismissive and said something along the lines of, oh, you know, she's just sleeping. And so the police said to him, look, you know, we're here on a welfare check. Your father sent us here to check on you guys. And so we have to go in there and wake her up and make sure she's okay. And so Ryan, again, was just a little bit weird and kind of defensive and didn't really immediately comply, but eventually did step out of the way. Then the police walked into the residence. They walked over to the couch. Couch. And as soon as they looked down at the girl on the couch, which was Heather, they saw right away that she was not asleep. She was dead. And she had been for at least a couple of days. She had died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Immediately, Ryan was arrested and brought out to a squad car. He didn't fight the arrest, but he did emphatically say he didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand what was happening. He didn't know what happened to Heather. He just seemed kind of generally confused. But regardless, he was thrown in the back of the police car outside the property, and he would sit there for several hours while more and more police and paramedics arrived to process the crime scene and also to transfer Heather's body to a morgue. Finally, around 5 a.m. on December 26th, the police brought Ryan, who was still in the back of this police car, to the Phoenix police station for questioning. The interrogation that followed, this hour-long interrogation that was all filmed, would start off relatively normally, but it would quickly devolve into this totally bizarre back and forth between Ryan and the detective who was questioning him. And then at the end of the interrogation, there would be this stunning revelation. From this point until the end of today's video, we're going to be showing you clips from the actual interrogation. When you get to the end of this video and you hear the revelation, and trust me, you will not miss it, I would encourage you to then go back and watch the clips of the interrogation or just go online and watch the entire interrogation because it's totally mind-blowing watching this thing knowing what's really going on. In the video, Ryan is led into this sort of nondescript, small interrogation room at 5.08 a.m. on December 26th. So he's just arrived at the station, they put him in the 
this room. He's wearing this white jumpsuit that might have been issued by police. Maybe he owned it, but it definitely looks more like prison attire. He's got no shoes on, no socks on, and his hands are not cuffed. And so he walks into the room and he sits down in the chair that's in the back corner of the interrogation room. And this chair is right next to this table. And then on the other side of this table is another chair. And so Ryan sits down in the corner. He's kind of facing out towards the middle of the room. He's quiet. He's basically not moving. And then at some point, he notices there is a handcuff that's connected to this table. Now, in some cases, the police would handcuff the person they were interviewing in this room. But in this case, Ryan was not told that he needed to put this handcuff on. He was uncuffed. So there was no directive that he needed to have this handcuff on. see where I'm pointing but <laughs> god damn like he got clocked by her hard After handcuffing himself to this table, Ryan turns and puts his arms over this table and he lays down, puts his head in his arms, and he lays that way for about five minutes. Periodically, he makes a few groaning sounds, but for the most part, he's quiet. And then all of a sudden, as he's laying there, he suddenly makes a fairly loud moaning sound and he stands up in his chair like he's gonna walk out of the room, but as soon as he starts to walk away, the handcuff stops him. The handcuff that he was not told to put on. And so he's stuck against this table, but he doesn't seem phased by it. He looks almost confused by what's happening, but he doesn't dwell on it for very long. Instead, he just reaches across the table and grabs a blank piece of paper, and then he just sits back down in the seat, he crosses his legs, and he starts looking at this piece of paper. At 5.17 a.m., so roughly nine minutes into this interrogation, which really hasn't even started yet, Ryan is intently looking at this blank piece of paper when a detective walks into the interrogation room. This detective was named Dalton and he informs Ryan that they're going to be taking pictures of his feet and so he needs to put his feet up on the table that's right next to him. Ryan at first acts very confused and doesn't really understand what's happening but he eventually complies and he puts his feet up on the table and by the time his feet are up there another officer walks into the interrogation room and he's got a camera and he's got this big kit with him and he would begin about a 10 minute long process of photographing Ryan's feet and also swabbing Ryan's feet. During this 10 minute session Dalton stays in the room and so Ryan periodically asks him if he can just leave and go home, seemingly unaware of how serious the situation really was for him. And when Dalton would tell him, no, you can't leave, Ryan would act totally frustrated and kind of angry and upset, kind of like how a child would act if they were told they couldn't have something they really wanted to. At 5.28 a.m., after this 10-minute session is complete and they've photographed and swabbed Ryan's feet, the second officer leaves the room and Dalton shuts the door behind him and then he walks over to the table and he grabs the chair on the other side from Ryan. He drags it out so it's closer to Ryan and then he sits down and introduces himself. After that, he begins asking Ryan some very basic questions. He asks him to confirm his name, which he does. He asks him to confirm his date of birth and his social security number and Ryan does both those things. And then he asks Ryan if he understands why he was there, why he was being interrogated. And Ryan says, no. And so at this point, Dalton says, okay, you know, let's just stop right now. I'm going to read you your rights. And so it's at this point in the interrogation that Ryan's behavior starts to get really, really weird. After Dalton tells Ryan he needs to read him his rights, you can see Ryan doesn't compute what he's saying. He's just kind of looking blankly and Dalton seems to pick up on that. And so he tries to make it kind of lighthearted and he says, you know, hey, Ryan, I'm going to read you your rights like they do on TV, you know, like on cops and on Law and Order and CSI and those crime shows they read people their rights that's what i'm gonna do you know what i'm talking about and ryan just goes no and dalton's kind of confused he's like you haven't seen any cop show where they read people their rights and at this ryan kind of changes his behavior and suddenly he's not as robotic he's a little bit defensive looking and he says oh yeah, I have, yeah. At this, it's pretty obvious to Dalton that Ryan is lying about something that is 
totally insignificant whether or not he's seen true crime TV shows. It really just didn't matter at all. And there's this weird hesitation where both of them are just kind of being quiet for a minute. It's like Dalton knows he's lying about it and Ryan just seems totally confused. And then ultimately Dalton just decides to not key in on this kind of weird lie that Ryan has just told. Instead, he just reads Ryan his rights. And then after that, he gets back into some basic questions. The next one was, hey Ryan, what was the highest grade you achieved in school? And now at this point, Ryan is not looking at Dalton. He's looking to the far side of the room. He's got this blank expression on. And when he's asked this question, he just says, I don't know. And Dalton's like, you don't know what level grade you achieved in school? And Ryan says, no, I don't know. Uh, eighth, eighth grade. So again, he's changed his answer fairly abruptly when he's challenged. And so Dalton is probably thinking to himself that he's lying again. But again, it's just kind of an insignificant thing, but it's building a pattern of mistrust here. It's hard for Dalton to believe that Ryan is going to be truthful if he can't even tell the truth about things that don't matter. But Dalton decides not to fixate on it. Instead, he asks a follow-up question based on the fact that Ryan has said eighth grade is the highest level he achieved. And so Dalton says, okay, well, did you get your GED? A GED is a high school diploma equivalent, and it's something you would get if you did not graduate high school. And since eighth grade is below high school, then Ryan clearly did not finish high school. And so it's a natural question to ask. The answer to this question is binary. You have a GED, you don't have a GED. But Ryan's answer is anything but binary. It's totally contradictory and weird, and it really begins to show a side of Ryan that just doesn't add up. He's acting totally weird. Do you, do you have a GED? I don't know. You don't know what? I don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. So what? What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, as in letter grade. I'm asking, did you graduate high school? No. And the highest you went was eighth grade? Mm hmm. Yep. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. After the discussion about Ryan's education goes nowhere, Dalton again does not fixate on all the issues with his answers so far, and instead just kind of continues asking more questions. And so he begins to address Heather. He starts by asking Ryan if he has a girlfriend. Now, Dalton at this point would know that Heather, the girl who was deceased, was Ryan's girlfriend because the police were asked to do the initial welfare check on Ryan and Heather, the couple. That's something that Dawn would have relayed to police. And so Dalton knows they have a relationship but he wants Ryan to tell him he has a relationship with Heather. So again, he asks Ryan, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And Ryan says, no, which is a lie. But Dalton goes along with it and says, okay, well, do you know a girl named Heather? And Ryan would say, yes, I do. But his description of Heather was just completely inaccurate. He said Heather was a 16 or 17 year old girl, even though she was actually 21. And he would say her last name was Kaiman. He thought, he wasn't entirely sure. He said she has nicknames and she has different names she uses but he believes it's Kaiman, even though her last name was actually Quan. Now, Dalton, of course, is aware of these discrepancies, but again, he does not fixate on them. He just keeps on asking more questions. Dalton asks Ryan, what happened to your face? You have this huge bruise on the left side of your face. You know, what happened? At first, Ryan says he doesn't know. But when Dalton pressed him and kept asking more and more questions about his face and how it happened, Ryan eventually would begin to open up. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? Um, I don't know. I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? I don't know. It was an accident. I forgot why. Like the other police officers involved, Dalton believed already going into this interrogation that Ryan killed Heather, that the bruise on his face was from Heather fighting back before ultimately Ryan killed her. 
And so for Ryan to say the mark on my face is from Heather, even though he claimed it was an accident, to Dalton, that was the same thing as Ryan saying, I killed Heather. Dalton attempted to get more specific details about the actual physical struggle that took place between Ryan and Heather, but as he asked more and more questions, he became more and more aggressive, and it seemed like Ryan picked up on it and became very defensive and started throwing out random pieces of information, much of which seemed untrue. Like he suggested there was at least two or three other people that were in the house on the night that Heather got killed, but it's unclear if these people were real or if they were actually ever there. And it just seemed like Ryan was kind of panicking and just kind of saying all sorts of random things. And so at some point, Dalton just wants to focus the conversation because he feels like it's getting totally out of hand. And so he just stops Ryan and he says, Ryan, there is a dead girl in your house and I need information. Hey, Ryan. Huh? Huh? There's what? a dead girl in your living room. She's dead? Yes. Heather? I don't know. I want to know what happened in your house last night. The girl on the couch is dead? I don't know. If she's on the couch, she's dead. The interesting thing about Ryan's reaction to being told by Dalton for the first time in the interrogation that there was a dead girl in his house is Ryan reacted with genuine surprise. It's the only time in the entire interrogation start to finish where Ryan sits forward in his chair, he kind of perks up, and he seems relatively normal. He's not acting confused and kind of bizarre. It's like he's really dialed in as if he had not heard this before, that he didn't know Heather was dead, and he's now for the first time being told, and it shocked his system. But just seconds after he sits forward and seems really engaged, he goes back to kind of being totally bizarre. And he also suddenly had this really elaborate story about what happened to Heather, even though just seconds ago, it seemed like he had just learned about it. So it didn't- You know, the weird thing is, and this is something that nobody will ever figure out. And even just looking at it and, you know, MRIs or, you know, uh, laboratories, or dissections of it um the human brain it just it's so fragile that if something happens a traumatic head injury i mean it could just change your whole world and i had mentioned this that once i got out of the music industry i started working for a company a nonprofit organization uh where my mom was one of the the leaders there um we would help people who were homeless or disabled or, um, you know, out on the streets. I mean, excuse me, we, we would help, you know, everyone in the community. And um, there was one guy in particular, just funniest, awesome guy. I mean, we had gone to his house once and uh, at this time I wasn't supervising. I was just, you know just would go and uh, job shadow him. What that means is just making sure that he's doing his job. And I mean, we go to his house and he has this beautiful house, you know, huge, like almost mansion size. And he's just like happy go lucky. Just, you know, we just thought that was his personality. And I never asked, you know, it's, it's not my business. You know, there's HIPAA laws. So unless they disclose, you know, I'm not going to ask, you know, what, you know, what's your disability? But he decided to tell me and my good friend once, because um, we would go and actually party with him. Here he was in his 40s, and uh, like two of my friends from high school uh, ended up working for the same place as I did. So we would go party with him, and this and that. Well, come to find out, he was an extremely successful advertising man uh, from New York to LA uh, to Denver. And one day he was riding his bike, uh, like a bicycle. Um, I think it was down Spear Boulevard underneath, kind of by the water. And there was like a lot of gravel. And somehow he lost control, hit his head, and boom. He lost his job there. Basically, I think he was the owner. He lost his, uh, his business, lost his wife. I mean, lost everything. And so, in a way, we kind of felt better that we were at least keeping him company. But in another way, it was like, I don't want to condone him to be drinking 
because how is that going to interact with, you know, his meds? And since I'm not, you know, a pharmacist or a doctor, you know, I'm not, it's, it's, you know, the two don't go together and they tell you that for a reason. They don't go together. So little by little, we, you know, kind of pulled back, but just any head injury could just mess somebody up so badly for life. And it's just, it's sad. It's sad to see. It didn't really make any sense that he would have a story so readily available for something he seemed to not know anything about. And of course, like all of his other answers, his story he gave was full of contradictions and holes and was just totally unbelievable. Well, these people came over, Richie and his dad, with shoot and arrow bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. They hit you and... They hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you, not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? Mm-hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They have revolvers. They have revolvers? Yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. Following this exchange, Ryan would change his story again and would say, actually, they didn't shoot me, they just shot Heather, they put me in a sleeper hold. But when Dalton asked him, what do you mean sleeper hold? Ryan said, oh, I don't know what a sleeper hold is. And then eventually, Ryan would actually just ditch the sleeper hold narrative and go back to the Richie and his father. They came in and they shot both of us. At this point, Ryan's story has become so convoluted and it's changed so many times that it's just totally unbelievable. And so Dalton, who was doing his best to kind of go along with Ryan's story, at this point just can't even pretend anymore. He cannot pretend that he's following the story. It doesn't make any sense. You're telling me, you're, you're all over the board here, number one. You're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing, and they, you're saying they shot you in the eye. Okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yes. And that's Is it, it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a if revolver. They shot you in the eye with a revolver. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. How do you know? It was most likely you'd be dead. That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. So you got shot first? Uh huh. And what happened? Did you fall to the ground? Yeah, I was trying to get up and, and I couldn't. I don't okay. know. And then she got shot? Mm hmm. What, why, what, what did you do? Nothing. Did you call 911? Uh -uh. Did you see if she was alive? She was sleeping still and that's it. I just let her sleep. She got shot in the side of the face and you let her sleep? Yes. This does not make sense, Ryan. After this exchange, Dalton just goes full bad cop on Ryan, openly accusing him of shooting and killing Heather, and Ryan just continues to say he doesn't know anything, that he didn't do it, and his answers are just totally nonsensical and contradictory and nothing is making sense. And so finally, at 5.52 a.m., roughly 45 minutes into this interrogation, Dalton is just at a loss. He does not know how to handle Ryan, because even though he really believes he did it, nothing Ryan has said has incriminated him, because nothing Nothing Ryan has said makes any sense. And so he's sitting there kind of thinking what he's going to do next. And then Dalton notices something. He notices something on Ryan's face. He this is crazy. This is exactly why I begged for anyone to start this video. Watch it till the very end. I was shocked as the first time I've seen this. <laughs> he tells Ryan to come closer. He needs to look at it. Let me see your nose. Come on, put your, put, your legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Okay. Yeah, be, be right back. 
what Dalton had finally just discovered were four bullet holes in Ryan's face and head. Ryan had committed no crime. He was a victim the same way Heather was a victim, but somehow Ryan had survived the attack. On December 23rd, so two days before the welfare check, two men attempted to break into Ryan and Heather's house. They were 23-year-old Richie Carver and his 54-year-old father, Larry Carver, the same Richie and Richie's father that Ryan had mentioned during the interrogation. They were there because of an altercation that had occurred between Richie and the couple about a month earlier. During that time, Richie was actually living with Ryan and Heather, but apparently he began hitting on Heather and Heather told Ryan and Ryan got really mad about it and Ryan and Richie got in this big fight and ultimately Ryan kicks Richie out of the house. Now this totally infuriates Richie and is very embarrassing for Richie and so right away he begins plotting his revenge. And so on December 23rd, Richie and his father, they were there to carry out this revenge plot. When the father and son got to the back of Ryan and Heather's house, Ryan saw them at the back door through the glass door that was near their kitchen and he ran over to try to stop them from getting inside, but Richie and Larry managed to barely get open the door and Richie reached in with his hand, which was carrying a gun, and he shot Ryan point blank twice in the face. The first bullet went in through his nose and then out the other side of his nose, so that's the first two bullet holes and then that bullet traveled back into his head through his left eye into his brain where it got lodged. And along with the bullet, six pieces of his skull that broke off from this bullet went inside of his brain as well. So that's the first three bullet holes. How could the police not know that? I mean, is it just that they so badly wanted to freaking rush through this crime scene and you know, automatically, like, yes, I know that, you know, there's a high, high percentage of people uh, that get killed is usually by their spouse or by, you know, whoever they're seeing. And so I could see how that may play a factor. But I mean, to not notice that, you know, yes, I do realize, too, by this time, it's been four days or three days that had passed. And... You know, the blood's probably dried up and all that still. But, I mean, to not, like, look him over at the crime scene before they throw him in a, a police vehicle. I mean, aren't they... I, I know here in Colorado, the law is, like, even if you're in a, a, a small little car accident, they have to have uh, paramedics take you to the hospital. So, you know, it has to be the case over there. I wouldn't imagine it being any different. So, it just, yeah, it blows my mind. And then the second bullet that was fired into Ryan's head hit the side of his head. It did not penetrate into his skull. So the bullet didn't lodge anywhere inside of his brain. However, it did break off a piece of his skull. And so that was the fourth bullet hole. Ryan dropped to the ground. He was unconscious. They assumed he was dead. They managed to force the door the rest of the way open. They stepped inside. They stepped over Ryan's body and they walked into the living room where Heather was cowering on the sofa. And Richie just immediately walked up, put a gun to her head and fired a single shot. After she had fallen to the ground, the two men stole some things in the house and then fled the scene. They would ultimately get caught and they're both currently serving life sentences. It's believed Heather died instantly from her gunshot wound, but Ryan didn't. At some point, maybe a couple of hours after he was shot, he woke up, but he had severe brain damage and he wouldn't have known what was going on. He didn't really know what happened. And he saw his girlfriend, Heather, lying on the couch, but he thought she was just sleeping. And so he too went to his bedroom and he fell asleep. But the next morning, he woke up and he still would have had no idea what was going on. And he spent the day on the 24th just kind of wandering around his house with his girlfriend lying dead on the couch. And so after a full day of just kind of mindlessly walking around his house, he went back to bed and then he got up on Christmas Day on the 25th and spent another day just kind of walking about his house with his girlfriend who he believed was sleeping but really she was dead and so finally the welfare check is called in the police show up and as soon as they see ryan they jumped to conclusions that he must have killed heather and it kind of dictated the way they treated him had they believed he was a victim they might have sought medical attention for the wound on his face 
But again, jumping to conclusions and assuming he was the killer, they figured that bruise on his face was from the woman fighting back. She had struck him before he had savagely killed her. And so they didn't give him any medical care. Instead, they put him out in the cop car out front of the property, and he sat there with no medical intervention for six hours. And during those six hours, literally every second that went by, there was irreversible brain damage being caused because he had all this bleeding inside of his head that was causing brain damage. And so the clock was ticking as soon as they found him. And for hours and hours and hours, he got no care and was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so finally, he goes to the police station. And again, they do not give him any medical care. Instead, they interrogate him for almost two hours, even though he has four bullet holes on his face that apparently no one noticed or no one took seriously. But regardless, he spent those almost two more hours in the interrogation room where every second that's going by, his brain is getting more and more destroyed, irreparably destroyed. And then finally, at the end of the interrogation, Dalton, who's probably thinking to himself, what is wrong with this guy? His answers don't make any sense. He's all over the place. And that's when he stepped back from looking for a way to convict this guy and noticed the holes on his face, specifically the hole in his nose. And that's when he called him forward and he looked at his face and he realized a huge mistake had been made and he called an ambulance. Here is a clip of the fire department who arrived ahead of the ambulance in the interrogation room learning about what's happened to Ryan as they wait for the ambulance. Hey guys. Hey guys. Captain, you're not going to believe this one. I can't believe it either. You're right. I've already heard the story. I can't believe it. Wow, that's a this is just my observations that... This might be an entrance, this might be an exit, this might be into his eye. And he's acting uh, like he has a serious head injury, which would make sense. Ryan was ultimately rushed to the hospital where he would undergo emergency surgery that would save his life, but it would come at a great cost. They not only had to remove a large portion of his brain, but they also had to remove both of his eyes. Now, it should be noted that at least one other source says he only had his left eye removed, but regardless, after the surgery, Ryan was no longer independent. He had so much brain damage, he couldn't take care of himself, and so he had to move back in with his parents, who became his full-time caretakers. And then 10 years later, Ryan would die from a seizure that was directly connected to the injuries he sustained from that attack and it's connected to the lack of care he received in those first critical eight hours after the police found him. The Phoenix Police Department, after this mishandling of Brian's case went public, they did an internal investigation, but no one was ever disciplined, at least not publicly. As for Ryan's family, they certainly could have filed a lawsuit against the Phoenix Police Department, but they chose not to. They said, the only thing we want is our son back, and a lawsuit will not give us that. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a sandwich of their choosing. But when you make it, make sure you construct it between two very thin, stale rye bread heels. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly two or three video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannels and hats and sweatshirts and mugs and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballen.com. If you wanna learn about upcoming deals and promotions in our shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. That is just one of the craziest stories that I have ever heard, ever. And I just had to share it with you guys, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, like always, leave me your comments, your thoughts. If you like it, that's awesome. But yeah, that just that story just freaks me out. I mean, I can't believe it. So until next time, I'm going to try to push through a couple tonight again. Uh, but yeah, um, have a good one. Stay safe out there.